front of me was Colossians 3.23 when it talks about work. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people, for men. So whatever you do, and all of us have a work to do, we say, well, maybe I'm just a housewife. Oh, what, a, what an amazing calling you have in your life to be a housewife, if that's what you're called to be. It may be a janitor. Can you imagine our world without someone who takes care of cleaning up after the slobs in our communities, in our culture? We're all needed, and God has given us a gift, and we're in, expected to use that for his glory and his honor. I want to talk a little bit about work, whether we're working or wrecking. Um, I feel sometimes maybe that I'm not always working the way I should, and maybe I'm doing more harm, more destruction than working. Um, and we, as, as a nation, pause this first and in, in September to, to remember the working man and woman in our culture and what contributions they have made that have made this nation what she is. I was reading a little bit about the history of that uh, and where we got the, the drive for a day to set aside to honor the laborer. Um, according to our history, back in the 1800s, the average man worked 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Imagine. We think we have it bad. And children as young as five and six were working in the mills um, um, because they needed to go out to somehow provide and help for the, for the provisions at home. There were no uh, welfare states or unemployment or all things that we have in our nation today. Um, we might question whether they've all been a positive thing, but that's another discussion for another time. But children as young as five and six, like those sitting up front here, even younger, working in, in mills in, in the 1800s in America, just to help to provide, to keep a roof over their family's head and food on the table. I have no idea what that would have been like. I have been blessed and I would expect you would say amen to that as well in your experience as Americans to live with all of the plenty that we have. Um, maybe not always a blessing, could be a curse as well. Um, and then thinking about our past and those who fought to say this isn't right to have ch child labor and make our children go to work, provide for the, for the home to bring food to the table hours a day, seven days a week. And so they fought for that. And unions came into being and, and got power and, and began to move uh, on the nation until at last it was um, made law that there would be a, a day set aside to honor that. And, and, and rules began to change concerning the working man and how many hours he had to work. And then we fast forward to today and it seems a pendulum has swung all the way to the other side where people don't even want to work. We have all the needs and these want ads. People need help. Enough people to fill the positions that are available. People found out that when, when the pandemic come, came and they were laid up for sent home, they made more home than they did going to work. Them to want to leave and go back to So it's not just limited to the world, it also affects the church of Jesus Christ, where people didn't want to work. And that's why the Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians addressed that, and I would like to read that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 6 through 15, it's page 996 in the Pew Bible if you want to follow along. And by the way, um, if you're visiting here and you don't have a Bible, Take that pew Bible along home. Consider it yours, a gift from us here to you. We want everyone that comes to our church to have a Bible. And so we put those in the pew for those who don't have one. Take it along. It is yours as our gift. Uh, God bless you. So on page 996 of the pew Bible, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning at verse 6. And now, dear brothers and sisters, we give you this command in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Stay away from all believers who live idle lives and don't follow the tradition they received from us. For you know what, that you ought to imitate us. We were not idle when we were with you. We never accepted food from anyone without paying for it. We worked hard day and night, so we would not be a burden to any of you. We certainly had the right to ask you to feed us, but we wanted to give you an example to follow. Even while we were with you, we gave you this command. Those unwilling to work will not get to eat. Yet we hear that some of you are living idle lives, refusing to work and meddling in other people's business. We command such people and urge them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and work to earn their own living. As for the rest of you, dear brothers and sisters, never get tired of doing good. Take note of those who refuse to obey what we say in this letter. Stay away from them so they will be ashamed. Don't think of them as enemies, but warn them as you would a brother or sister. May God bless his word to us today. I found that in fascinating that Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica about the importance of, of working and not living idle lives as what they were doing. A part of me can understand why they perhaps were disconnecting from life because they were some of them were believing that the rapture had already happened and they had missed it and, and there was a lot of concern about their loved ones who, who had died and weren't there for the rapture and, and so they were expecting the Lord's return and so it's happened even in, in our uh, nation where, where people set dates for the Lord's return and, and those who were following that speaker, that leader, that preacher who said this is when the Lord's going to return would disconnect society, they would quit their jobs, they would go to a mountain or wherever they went just to wait for God to return, and he didn't. Maybe that's why he says we're not supposed to know the hour, the day. We're not supposed to set dates for his return, because no one knows that but the Lord. But so I can kind of understand why they were this way, um, but there's also a danger because as Christians, they were taking care of one another. Look at the book of Acts and how the church in its um, in its infancy, its foundation. They had all things in common. They were taking care of each other's needs. And if anyone had lack, they just threw it together and they, and they were able to, to feed. But as time went on, they, they found that, that, that just they couldn't sustain that. And so they began to provide for the needs of their local body. But I was, I was amazed that here Paul, in this second letter, this is now the third time that he has written or told the Thessalonians, get to work. Three times he told them in, in the second letter was written in the space of about a year from the first letter. And before that he was with them in person and told them about their need to work. And, and here he is again, reminding them of the importance of working and, and what to do with a Christian brother or sister who refuses to work which is again something that, uh, it, that surprises me, uh, how, how important, how critical Paul viewed um, idleness, uh, laziness, an unwillingness to work. So I look at this, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, this is what I'm taking away from this, this poor scripture is that I need to be reminded I need to be reminded again and again and again. And you as parents know that with your children, as you're raising them, you tell them about what the rules of the house are, what their expectations are. Do they get it the first time, second, third, third, fourth? I can't imagine they're different from ours. We had to sometimes write them down and put them on the refrigerator and tell them again and again and again because they just didn't get it. I probably said it before and I'll say it again. Sitting in a, in a teaching by a... Kevin Eshelman at uh, ECC, uh, some of the leadership team years or so ago, and he said that uh, when, they, when it comes to their vision casting as a, as a church, he keeps casting it again and again because it's been his experience that people will forget what he preached that Sunday morning come Tuesday, they'll forget what he had to say. That's just who we are. We're so quick to, to move on to something else that we, we forget. 
So we need to be reminded. Peter in his epistle says, I will not neglect to give you a reminder. He says it again and again in that chapter. We need to be reminded of the importance of work. It is our responsibility, our task. It's why we were created. It's important that we um, recognize the, the, um, the, the rapid pace of life and how, how little time we act, have to do what we ought to do to accomplish the things. Jesus said that in John chapter 9 and verse 4. He says, we must quickly carry out the task assigned by the one who sent us, for the night is coming when no one can work. Jesus had little over three years to, to proclaim the message that he was sent to proclaim. And he did not um, fall short of com completing that task. You read in John chapter 17, he says, I've Finish the task you've given me. Um, we, if you're under the age of 70, you probably don't have a real appreciation for how fast time is going and, and how little time you really have to get things accomplished. A study was done about those years, those 70 years of his life. 24 years have been spent sleeping. 14 years working, eight years in amusements, six years at the dinner table, five years in transportation, four years in conversation, three years in education, and two years in studying and reading. His other four years were spent in miscellaneous pursuits. And five minutes were each day. This adds up to a not all impressive total of five months that he gave to God over the 70 years of his life. Let that sink in a little bit. If you want to copy this, I'll make sure you get one. Just, to, just imagine 70 years. That seems like a long time. For some of you, it seems like an eternity. For me, not so much. It's not near as old as it used to be. Um, but you start taking, and I would encourage you, you want, you want to do a study of your life Start writing down the things you do. And they go on to say, uh, for the faithful church girl who attended Sunday school and three one-hour services a week, he would have spent only one year and nine months in church out of 70 years. That's not a lot, folks. And it worked in father's business. And that's when we find it to do when there's something, an activity at church. We don't have much time to get it done, as, even if we're faithful. Less than two years of your life, you're going to give to the Lord's service. Um, so maybe we need to reevaluate. Maybe that's why we need to be told, to be reminded that we're here to serve him. Isn't that what Jesus said? The Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve. And we as his disciples are not greater than our master. We are supposed to imitate him, to follow his example. Psalm 39, verse 4 says, Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered, how fleeting my life really is. I want to remind you of that today as we think about Labor Day, about work. How much time on your calendar have you and I set apart for the Lord? I can't answer that for you, but, but just look at your calendar. Look at your checkbook. Where, where are all of those things you're spending going? How much of that, what percentage of that is actually going for the Lord and his work, the work he's called you to do? The second lesson I see from 2 Thessalonians 3 is that we as Christians are to serve as examples to other Christians. If I'm someone who just is lazy and doesn't do, I'm just looking for handouts or the easy way, what does that say to another believer watching my life? Does it give him a sense of justification not to have to do it? Because Mel doesn't, so why do I have to do that? We have to remember, folks, we are examples. People are always watching us. You've heard about our children, how much they watch what we do and say, the things we attend, give our monies to. We are examples. Paul says he could have demanded that they give him sustenance, but he wanted to be an example to the church at Thessalonica. And so he worked night and day to provide for himself and for his own. 
so that he could be an example to them how a Christian ought to live in the world. We are examples to our families. Um, not those just under our roof, but our extended families as they look at us who claim to be followers of Christ and watch to see what we do with our life, with our gifts, with our talents, with our finances, whatever it is, it will have an impact on them about who our God is, how big our God really is. It's amazing how a mother and dad can influence succeeding generations you may have heard of the Jukes family, the Jukes family. There was about 1,200 descendants from this family. I thought about that with my parents when we would get together once a year in the effort of Mennonite school to use their gymnasium because the family was too big to just gather at somebody's house. And there were, the last that we were able to attend was pre-pandemic. We were over 110. And my brother would kid my mom and say, Mom, you realize you're responsible for all of this. That's going to be a good thing, right? I mean, yay. But it's also quite a, uh, a reminder of the responsibilities that we have. This parent, these parents, this Jukes family, had 1,200 descendants. And they traced them down. Some 400 were physically self-wrecked. I'm not quite sure what that means. Maybe they were alcoholics or drug addicts for whatever reason. 400 of them were physically wrecked. 310 were professional paupers. 130 convicted criminals, 60 habitual thieves and pickpockets, and seven murderers. While out of the whole number of 1,200, only 20 ever learned a trade, and half of these learned it in prison. What a legacy to leave. But that's the example that we leave families. Um, and then you could look at the Jonathan Edwards family and the descendants that he left, coming from a very godly perspective. Jonathan Edwards, his father was a preacher, his mother's father was a preacher, and out of the 400 descendants of Jonathan Edwards, 14 were college presidents, 100 were professors, 100 of them were ministers of the gospel, missionaries, or theological teachers. More than 100 of them were lawyers and judges, of the whole number, 60 have been doctors and many other authors of high rank or editor, editors of journals. What a difference a godly influence leaves as an example for the generations that follow. Just something again that I believe Paul would remind us and encourages us as Christians living in our affluent nation that we not let down our guard and doing the work God has called us and equipped us to do, because we are examples. That old adage is certainly true. More is caught than taught. So we need to be careful. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 17, in the New King James Version, Paul writes, Brethren, join in following my example. Note those who so work as you have us for a pattern. For a pattern. We we're called to follow Paul's example. Jesus says, follow me. Um, what kind of example am I? And this came to real um, clear focus uh, on Friday. So Thursday, sometimes when I'm not at the church office, I always call in to get my messages. So Thursday at lunch, I called the church, and I, the message I got was, this, phone num this number has been disconnected or is no longer in service. So I thought, well, maybe it was just my phone. I called Mickey. I sent Mickey a text that, hey, check the phone. See if it's telling me it's out of service. And then so I called um, our local phone company here. And uh, of course, they didn't answer. They said, leave a message and we'll get back to you promptly, promptly. I didn't hear nothing till the next afternoon. And they still hadn't called me. So I checked the phone and still got the same message. This number has been disconnected or it's no longer in service. So I, I called again to our local phone company, and they answered. And, and we, the, the receptionist remembered me, because Mickey and I were there just a month ago trying to sort out some things with our phone and our Wi-Fi, and, and, and it straightened out, and, and it was. And so for a number of weeks, it's been working fine, and suddenly it's been disconnected. 
I'm thinking, I'm sure George paid the bill. I can't imagine. <laughs> Never was brought up. She looked at She said, yeah, that doesn't make sense. Well, I'm going to connect you with somebody that can help you a service. So I'll, fine, she connected me. Uh, I was connected to five different people all around the world. I'm only guessing because some of their accents, I could barely understand their English. Uh, one for sure I knew was from Connecticut because she talked about wanting to move to, to uh, Pennsylvania. I said, yeah, come on to effort. No, I didn't. I was, <clears throat> anyway, for 75 minutes, I was on the phone trying to get our line reconnected here at the church, a number that we've had for at least 40 years. It's not working. She finally, we said goodbye with the promise from her that it would be repaired within 24 hours. That would have been yesterday at lunchtime. I checked this morning. It's still not working. So I'm going to try again Tuesday. I'm going to go to the office in person, and maybe I'll get some backup. I'm going to look for a big bouncer. I'll take somebody along. That would, no, I'm kidding. All along, while I was on the phone for those 75 minutes, it was a little over that, I was thinking about what, what kind of example am I leaving with these five different individuals? What are they thinking of me when they hang up or pass me on to the next person? Knowing that I was preparing to share about us being examples so I went out of my way. I really make sure I was, I was pleasant, I was positive, I was grateful for their help, and I told them to have a great weekend, and I really wanted to make sure that I didn't, didn't burn any bridges that I'm going to have to go back and repent over. Um, may, may I just say it's not always that way. Um, I know by the time I got to number five, I could feel the blood pressure coming up. And, uh, but gratefully, it ended well, and I, I'm here to report that that was a good example on Friday. Um, talk to me on Tuesday. We'll see what happens. <laughs> the truth of it all is, folks, we are, we are living examples of the Lordship of Christ. The Bible says we are ambassadors of Christ. So we are to portray kingdom values. So Jesus was dealing with that person, all five of those on the phone. How would he have responded to them and their help? That's how I'm supposed to respond. That's how you are supposed to respond. And when you go out to work on Tuesday or maybe tomorrow or even this afternoon, I don't know what your schedule uh, re- You and I are going out as though Jesus was walking in our shoes and we are being examples of him to them the desire of wanting them to know our God because you're different than everybody else that I work with. Any of those five people's fault that we were having the trouble that we were having here with the phone, I don't know whose fault it is. It's probably just a glitch in the computer system that's, yeah, way too big to manage. But it will be resolved. I'm confident of that. But Things like that are just a good reminder to me and should be to you how important it is that we that we are portraying our Father in heaven in the way He wants us to portray Him as His children. And that's going to get more difficult, as Mark shared this morning, and I appreciate what he had to share. You know, there's, there's great times happening in the church and all around our communities. People are being saved and baptized. The church is, is feeling the blessing of that. But along with that, we're awakening the enemy's concern about the church. And he is going to look for ways to persecute, to uh, disillusion, to take away our joy, whatever he can to destroy what the Lord is doing. We need to be prepared for that. Um, And then lastly, the thing that I see is the church, how we are to respond to those who who don't follow God. the commands of Scripture. I thought I think it's harsh. As I was reading Paul's words to the church at Thessalonica, saying, "If one of you is not working, ostracize him or her, make them feel guilty or ashamed for living in a disobedience to God's word." I don't know that I have an appreciation for what it must have been like in the first century church when people came out of Judaism and joined the church, the way Jesus Christ gave their allegiance to Jesus, how they were ostracized from the rest of society, from the synagogue, how they were looked down upon and made fun of and 
and just cut off from the rest of, of what was happening in the nation. I believe a good example could be what happens to an Islam when they, when they are converted to Christ and how they are treated by the family. They are cut off as if they don't exist and some are threatened to be killed because they walked away. We don't have that appreciation, I don't, for what that would mean. But here are some young Christians in the church of Thessalonica, I believe, who, who got caught up and, and, and just disconnected from their responsibilities. And, and Paul is saying, listen, you, you need to do what God has told us to do, to be staying active, to be, to be busy, to be working to provide for our needs, and, and not only ours, but for others who are in need. Get to work. And those of, among you who are not working, not to, to bring them to a place of repentance, of changing their ways. Um, not to bail them out or give them an excuse, but to, to help them to see that, that what they're doing is wrong. Uh, Paul was strong and firm. You, you read the letter to the church of the, at Corinth and, and how he instructed the congregation, the children of, of God, to respond to this young man who was living in sin. Um, it was hard. We, have, we don't know what church discipline is because we are reluctant to, to impose that upon others. And yet Paul didn't hold back with this church, saying... What you're doing, believers, is wrong. You need to repent and, and do what you've been commanded to do. But he does finish with saying, don't treat them as a non-believer. They are still our brother and sister in the Lord. Treat them accordingly, but help them to understand that this is not behavior that honors the Lord, and they need to change. So what lessons can we take away um, from this words and work. Well, the first one that I, that I see and what I share with the children is I need to remember, I need to be reminded I was created to work. Adam was put in the Garden of Eden when there was no sin. Everything was perfect, but he was put there to tend and take care of the garden. I don't know what that was, but I'm of the opinion that it wasn't work in the idea that we think of work that it's toilsome and, and a drudgery and it's just to be, um, yeah, somehow avoided at all cost. Uh, and that's why I was trying to get the children to understand when they know what their gift is, the thing that they enjoy and what God is gifting them and calling them to do, it won't be a toilsome drudgery. They will be excited about doing that job. And they will be gifted to do it well to bring honor to the Lord. Whatever your calling is, the work, the place where you are now, make the most of it. Be profitable for your employer because the Lord will be honored by it. I and you were created to work. And I, I don't want to burst your bubble, but I'm, I'm of the, when we get to heaven, we're going to be working. There are going to be things for us to do in heaven. We're not going to be sitting around on clouds stringing harps. There are going to be things God is calling us, giving us to do, um, to be responsible for, to judge over, to reign over. It'll be exciting. And we won't dread getting up to go to work. In fact, we won't have to worry about getting up. It's going to always be day. No sleepless nights. And I believe, too, as I shared before, we need to be reminded, reminded of the importance of obeying Scripture. I think of Hebrews chapter 10 in verses 24 and 25 where it reads, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encouraging one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. We need to be thinking of ways to encourage and motivate each other to do our job, to do the tasks we're called to do. Thirdly, we are living examples. Um, the next time you're in the middle of a project or in the kitchen making dinner or whatever it is, 
clean up a mess alone, wherever. Uh, remember that someone is watching. And how you respond to burning whatever you burn or not. Um, remind yourself, I'm, I'm a living example of how Jesus would respond to this. And the people that I'm interacting with, this is the example, maybe the only example they'll see an experience of what my God is like. We are living examples and we are leaving them behind. And then lastly, we need to hold each other accountable. Um, difficult as it is, we need to hold each other accountable. I want to say something at the, the outset of this, of last weekend. Um, it, was a, it was a fun time. And we ate like we ate. Let's just leave it there. We really ate a lot of food. Um, we had good cooks and we had good fellowship. It was an emotional time. There were roller coasters. We had highs and, and then we had lows. And uh, Tina and I came home. We had planned to, to do a, a Sunday school activity Sunday evening. Till we got home and unpacked, we decided that's as far as we're going. We were just emotionally exhausted. It was a good exhaustion, but it was that's how it was in our experience. Uh, it, was, it was a blessing, and I'm sure you're going to hear more about uh, those things going forward. We got to know each other as brothers and sisters, as fellow leadership team members, and husbands and wives, and um, it was good. We were able to speak truth into each other's hearts. Things we see and know and experience from one another was just brought out and, and shared with each other, and, and it was really good. It was good. We need to hold each other accountable. Um, Chuck Swindoll, one of my favorite authors, in his book, um, uh, Dropping Your Guard, writes of an experience that he had years ago where someone saw him driving his 1979 refurbished, refurbished Volkswagen Super Beetle convertible through a, a red light in Fullerton, California. And they sent him a message, said, you will either meet us for breakfast or this is going to be made public. And so he went to the restaurant to meet his accuser. And he got there early to ask for a table. And he made a sign for the front of his shirt um, <clears throat> that said, guilty as charged. His friends from church came and admitted all the sign. They began to laugh and chuckle about that. And, and he admitted his guilt. Uh, and, uh, and then he turned the sign over. On the back of that sign, it said, he is without sin. Let him cast the first stone. Well, they ended up buying him bread, and they had a good time of fellowship. And he never forgot when he comes to a red light that somebody's watching. And he said it was a great lesson of the importance of accountability. Even though it was done in a lighthearted setting, it, re it reminded him, and it needs to remind you and I that someone's watching. And they may never say anything. They may never call you out, even though perhaps they should. But you and I, we're going to be held accountable someday, right? Someday you and I are going to stand before the judgment seat of God. And he's going to, he's going to lay it all out there. And we're going to receive either rewards or it's going to be burned up. Um, and so it's important that as we go back to work after this holiday weekend and we begin to prepare for the next season of life, whatever it is, that the work that you are doing, God has ordained for you to do. And probably no one else can do it as good as you can do it. And do it as unto the Lord and not unto man. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for, uh, thank you for calling us out. Just as you through the pen of the Apostle Paul to the church at Thessalonica, could be to the effort of the United Zion Church, are saying, folks, you need to be obeying the command of God. You need to be working and to doing it and not just for your own benefit, but for, but for the benefit of others and especially for the glory of our God. And so I pray, Lord, may this be another time to remind us as we celebrate this Labor Day weekend, many going away, doing activities, cookouts, whatever it might be, 
And may we never lose sight of why we were created, Lord, in the first place. Very, from the very beginning, in that perfect setting, in the Garden of Eden, you placed man, the Bible says, whom you made to take care of the garden, to tend it, and to keep it. And I believe from then on through Scripture, we can see how you are calling us to work, to do the task we're called to do. Here to the church of Thessalonica, to the church at EUZ, we are called to do the work God has given us to do. Lord, may we do it to the best that we can, knowing that we are your representatives to the world, to my brothers and sisters, as they look at the job that I do. May they glorify you. May they see that he's doing, he's doing it well. She's doing it well. She is a good ambassador for the kingdom of God. Our world needs good examples, Lord. May we, as the church of Jesus Christ, um, be those living testimonies for the world around us, I pray. In the name of the Lord Jesus and for his sake, Amen. Amen. Let's stand and, and uh, worship with one more song. And, and certainly if anybody wants prayer, um, you're always welcome to come down front here. Some people will gather and pray with you, whether it's about what Mel shared or, or something else. If your heart's heavy, um, just come on up and we'll pray with you. So. Our God, firm foundation, our rock, the only solid ground, as nations rise and fall. Kingdoms once strong, now shaken, but we trust forever in your name, the name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Justice, you will reign. Every knee will bow. We bring our expectations. Our hope is anchored in your name. The name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus. Victorious, you are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. And you are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. We lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus. From age to age, you reign. Your kingdom has no
the king you are the only king there is no no God beside you you have the words of eternal life and I pray father if there's someone in the sound of my voice who doesn't know Jesus as Lord and Savior today Holy Spirit would you work would you speak to those hearts would you call them to know Jesus the one who died on a cross to pay for the penalty of their sins to prepare them for eternity in your presence gift of eternal life through our faith in Jesus Christ and now may the Lord bless you and keep you may the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace may the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord amen God bless you